Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's local group online talk. Uh, my name is Harriet, and I work for the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Um, and I am joined tonight by our Rutland local group and Natalie Cossa, who um, actually also works for the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Um, before I pass over to the Rutland group to introduce uh, Natalie, I just want to let you all know that if you have any questions throughout the talk, please just pop them in the Q&A box um, along the bottom and then at the end we'll go through as many uh, questions as we've got time for. Um, and just quickly that we are really delighted to be able to offer these talks for free, but if you would like to um, give a donation to help um, help us with the, the costs of um, organising the talks and also to support all the work we do for wildlife in Leicestershire and Rutland, uh, please go to our website at www.lrwt.org.uk forward slash donate. Okay, enjoy the evening everybody and I'll now pass over to Anthony. Thanks Harriet, thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone. I'm Anthony Biddle, I'm chair of the Rutland Members Group and it's great to uh, have so many of you here to join us this evening. Um, just to let um, everyone know that actually after Natalie's presentation, uh, we're going to run our group AGM. Um, so I would ask that um, as many Rutland members uh, can hang on for a few minutes after the end of the, um, of the, of the talk um, so that we can do our business. But of course, anyone who doesn't want to um, stay for our AGM, you're quite welcome to, to leave at that time. I'll just uh, give that information now. Thank you. So tonight we're very um, pleased that uh, Natalie Cossa from uh, the Wildlife Trust is, um, is joining us. Um, some members of our, of our group have been working with Natalie over the last uh, year or so, um, and uh, Natalie's going to talk to you about the bats of Rutland. So thank you very much, Natalie. Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you for having me. So yes, I work for the Wildlife Trust, but I also um, am part of the Leicestershire and Rutland Bats group. And although it's just me here, this talk has also been um, written by Jenny Harris, who is also in the audience somewhere. So I'd like to thank Jenny for her contribution to today's talk. So let me share screen and this is where everything gets nerve wracking. All right, so can one of the panel give me a thumbs up that that's all okay? Thanks Harriet. Right then, so Bats of Rutland. So what I'm going to do then this evening is talk about uh, just a very, very brief introduction to bats and then talk about the Bats in Your Backyard project, which Anthony just mentioned and the results and then other bat activities that have taken place in Rutland. So bats account for almost a third of all mammal species in the UK. There are 18 species in the UK, 12 of which are found in Rutland. And all British bats are insectivorous. So they eat all sorts of um, insects from midges, mosquitoes, to spiders, um, earwigs, caterpillars, things like that. Um, all bat species in the UK are protected by law, both the bat and its roost, whether the, root, whether the bats are in the roost at the time or not. They use a wide range of habitats, such as wetlands, woodlands, farmland, and urban areas. And they're excellent indicators for the wider health of the UK's wildlife, because they rely on insects, sort of the impact of, uh, of, of, sort of farming and agriculture, um, urbanization, uh, things like that affect insects, which in turn affect bats. So they're very good indicators as to what's going on with the general health of um, the countryside. So what happened was, is in 2018, the Leicestershire Rutland Bat Group bought this uh, type of bat detector. It's called an SM4. Um, and it's a great bat detector because you can put it um, outside in your garden. Um, the microphone's down here. Um, and you can program it so it records at night and it only records when uh, bats go past or sometimes we pick up wrens and blackbirds as well, which is quite nice. So they're very easy to set up. So the Bat Group bought this with the aim of lending it out to local natural history groups um, to, to just to record to see, you know, the ones who wanted to find out what bats were in their local area. So we started this Bats in Your Backyard project and we've covered lots of different areas within Leicestershire, but we haven't come, covered Rutland. Unfortunately, we had some people from the local group who were keen to, um, to be involved. So, 
So here, so the Rutland local group, we had uh, different people borrow it in last year. So we had one location in Oakham, um, two locations in Aldgate, Ketton, one location in Ridlington and three locations in Halstead. And before the Rutlanders say it, yes, I know Halstead isn't in Rutland, but um, one of the local um, group members lives in Halstead, which some of you may know. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so it was a, a really nice spread. And then what happened was, is the people would, would put out the batch detector in their gardens or their lands, paddocks, fields, wherever. It would record at night, record on um, these sound files onto an SD card. And then I'd look at all these um, sonograms to determine what bat species um, were recorded in the area. So for those who don't know, there's the 45 kilohertz here, and these hockey shoe shapes indicates it was a common pipistrelle. And then these straight lines here indicate it's some kind of myotis bat. Right, so bats in the survey area. So I had a look at the records for the from Leicestershire and Rutland Environmental Records Centre, LRUC, uh, shortly, um, for these four one kilometer tetrads. So as you can see, it's where, where all these red dots are, uh, where there are records on um, LRUC system. So for these four tetrads, before we started surveying, there were six different species and 115 records. So it was pretty well covered, but that we can always find out more. So there were 28 nights of recording overall in sort of, uh, July and August time. Um, over 10,000 bat passes were recorded. So each bat pass was, had, was sort of analysed by me um, looking at the sonograms. And the lo Rutland local group have added an additional 157 records to the LaRoque database and three additional species have been added to the recording area. The Barbastel, the Nathusius pipistrelle and the Lyslers. So I'll go into more detail about each location now. So sorry, I'm on two screens. I'm just minimising that. There we go. All right. So the first location in Oakham was on Beach Road. So as you can see here, I'm not sure which of the houses it was. I think it's one on a corner, but I'm not 100%. But anyway, I don't want to reveal the house. So as you can see here, it's a typical sort of urban area, um, nice trees in the gardens, lots of lawns. There's a very large sort of allotment here on, on, this, on the right hand side here. And it did really well. It um, recorded um, oh, six different species. Ah, it's missing. Sorry about that. <laughs> So it recorded, yeah, six different species outright, which is really good, plus some Nictula species. Um, and the reason why um, you'll see, you'll see Nictula species, Pipistrelle species and Myotis species. And they're because um, I could um, identify it to genus level, but not to um, species level because there wasn't enough detail in the call or it was a bit too ambiguous. So anyway, so for this urban site, um, six different species was really good. Um, as you can see, the common pipistrelle was the um, most recorded with 223 bats recorded over that survey area. Um, I've included a, a photograph here of an enthusiast pipistrelle. Um, it's, it was only sort of recently identified in sort of mid 2000s. It's a migratory species um, that migrates long distances, thousands of kilometers. I mean, some have been found in, in uh, the UK that have been ringed in Latvia and um, they'll travel thou you know, over a thousand kilometres. Um, and only a small number of maternity roosts have been found in the UK and they roost primarily in crevices, um, you know, behind bark or tree holes and they do use bat bird and bat boxes. The majority of roosts are located close to last, large freshwater lakes. So obviously being in Rutland, there's no bigger, larger freshwater than Rutland water. So there's ideal habitat here for the Nathusis pipistrels. Um, they were, they've been found using the bat boxes of Rutland Water um, and including bat boxes located in Barnsdale and Hambleton Woods. And they've also been caught during um, Nathusis trapping sessions at Rutland Water, which I'll go into more detail later. So here is a table that shows you the evening um, uh, the evening. So here on the left hand side will be sunset throughout the night and this is then sunrise. So each dot represents a bat that's been um, identified to, to species or genus level. So it may look like there's lots, there's lots of dots here. It doesn't mean that 
each dot is an individual bat. It could be the same bat just flying around in circles and being um, picked up on the bat detector again and again and again. But still, it's still really good. It shows this sort of activity throughout from dusk till dawn, um, which shows us all there's insects sort of throughout the night. Here's a photograph of Eliza's bats. Um, they sort of fit nicely in your palm and they've got this long shaggy fur. This was the only location where Lysler's was recorded and it's an uncommon batter within Rutland um, and, in, and in Leicestershire, but uh, it's sort of increasing in, in, in range. So they've got this lovely shaggy fur and they're a tree species. Uh, they, they love living in uh, woodlands, uh, but can be found in houses. Um, there's a roost in Woodhouse Eaves. They feed on flies, moths and beetles and things like that. So here we are, this is the second location, well, it was location two and three in Allgate in Ketton. So location two was here in, in someone's back garden, a wooded garden uh, with a large pond and the um, river Chater running along it. And then there's location three here, just across the track um, in an orchard um, with sort of um, a lot sort of uh, pasture. So I've got the dog scratching the door. Um, uh, yeah, grace fields. Okay, so we'll go through these. Okay, so here we go. So, as you can see here, there are five species recorded, but high volume, high number of bats. Um, over th yeah, in those few nights, there were three thousand seven hundred and two uh, bat passes. So high activity, and this will be due to the fact that it was a sort of wooded area, the large pond, and the river. It's just prime uh, insect habitat. Um, um, for bats, um, which is why the, the numbers are, in, uh, are so high, especially for common pipistrelle. If you look along here, uh, 566 passes in just one night. Um, what as well would be interesting as well to see is, is the sort of the, the number rises here is that it's potentially when the juvenile bats are starting to come out. So the bats um, give birth to one, uh, one young a year. And after about three weeks of being weaned, they, they sort of start flying for themselves. And it's sort of roughly the, the time when they'll start flying. So this could, it, this could indicate there's a sort of a, a roost uh, close by. And um, so the first uh, Rutland record for, um, oh yeah, so sorry. We also, so we picked up Barbastel as well, which is really good. Um, there's only four records for Barbastel, um, but, that, but that's really good. Barbastels are pretty quiet, echolocating. They're very hard to, to pick up on the bat detector. And they sort of, um, when they're commuting, they sort of have their heads down and fly and then just bomb along really fast. Um, you know, they don't, if this isn't their foraging area, they're just sort of um, just basically commuting from, from roost to foraging area. So getting these few numbers is not a sign that oh, it's not very good. It's, these are really good numbers uh, for Barbastel. Um, the first record for Barbastel was in September 1986, when a small group of Barbastels was found during work prior to the conversion of Barnsdale Hall into a hotel and country club. Um, and the people who don't know, the, the hall is on uh, the north shore of Rutland Water, and the bats were found in a stable block close to the house. But unfortunately, the roost was destroyed by building work, um, so the roost no longer exists there. However, there have been um, a few uh, records in Burley Woods, Ketton and Hambleton, with some um, hibernation sightings too in, in nearby tunnels. And a female who lactated was caught in Burley Wood in 2017, and a juvenile was caught and killed by a cat at Market Overton, I think it was 2018. So it shows they're breeding in the area, so we just don't know where their roosts are. And these bats are incredibly rare. Um, they're a UK um, BAP uh, species. Um, yeah, and, and, and very rare to have. So that was a really good, a really good to, to pick that up there. Uh, they'll tend to roost behind loose bark and in tree crevices, but also use uh, flat bat boxes. Um, and they'll eat mainly small moths, uh, diptera, um, small beetles and other flying insects. Okay, so if we look then at the, so again, this is um, sunset, so this is sunrise. So as you can see here, a lot more dots here, just a lot more activity. So I'm sorry if you're colorblind, I, I didn't have time to change the charts. Um, so I hope this still looks okay. Um, so the light blue here are soprano pipistrels, the dark blue are common pipistrels, and then these sort of purpley uh, are nocturals um, and brown long eared. So you can see there's a lot of activity, you know, just at sunset when you do expect, the bats are emerging from their roosts, they're hungry, and there's just, it's just solid of, of um, activity here. 
and then but the activity you know carries on throughout the night apart from the first night so i guess what happened was that it rained um, if it rains heavily the insects don't come out so the bats don't come out just to save their energy so um but you can see it's a really good source you know the water the pond the river the woodland continuous source of insects at that time of day is ideal and with sort of lactating females i can imagine them just you know just just feeding all along here it should be pretty busy All right, so the, um, so sorry, the, this, this this one here, this was done um, sort of uh, towards sort of the third week of July. And then the bat detector returned here in on the 22nd of August. So again, look, you can see there are even more, um, even more common pipistrelle, 698 that night. So, I mean, it would have been impressive to be out there with bat detector. It would have been, it would have been going off um, um, big time. And again, we picked up Barbastel. Um, there are a few, uh, you can sort of see this like red dot behind here. So again, uh, you know, three passes that night. So again, it's, it's a really good, although the number looks low, it's a really good indicator, you know, the barbastel activity, it's regular activity. Um, barbastels are very uh, faithful to uh, flight lines and I just use the same routes again and again, night after night. So, you know, this is a really good sign. And just the sheer number of, of, of bats uh, just shows what good habitat that is there. The soprano pipistrelle here was at 440, um, which again is a really good number. And it's not too surprising because soprano pipistrelles are more dependent on uh, woodlands, wet woodlands, water. So having the pond and the river chater just there, it, it's just their ideal uh, feeding habitat. And um, it's got a sort of paler face. You can sort of really see the eye uh, clearly there. Um, and yeah, they'll eat lots of mayflies, lace wings, biting and non-biting midges. So they're ideal to have in your back garden so you don't get bitten to death when you're, when you're outside enjoying the nice uh, summer evening. Um, many, um, although we pick, you know, we, we record them, um, we do have lots of roost for this species as well. And that could be because they roost in high numbers. Um, so they may be more visible and, and seen by homeowners but also because they're in high numbers and, and they're quite smelly animals. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so maybe people detect them a bit more. Okay, so this is the third location at Allgate. Oh yeah, it was horse and sheep paddocks, I say I can remember. So the, the batch detector was placed in an open orchard um, next to horse and sheep paddocks. So it was put in uh, for two separate nights, one on the 25th of July and one on the 25th of, uh, 21st of August. So as you can see, you know, there's a lot of a, a smattering of, of um, of records here throughout the night. Uh, definitely on the second time in August, there's a lot more myotis um, activity. Um, and the reason for this, I don't know what the weather was like, you know, maybe it was a bit wetter, maybe it suppressed the insects, or it was a bit colder, stopped the insects coming out. Um, or it could be that the um, horse and sheep paddocks um, had been heavily grazed, so were very short, the sward was very short height, um, which would have reduced the sort of insect activity um, sort of going on in that area. Um, I don't know it myself, so I'm not sure, but yeah, there they could be a few reasons why um, why there's not much activity, even though it's just across the, the road from the, from the other area. Or it could be just all the bats from this area just going straight down to the, to the river Chater. Um, so here pictured here are Dorbenton's bats. So these uh, three bats here are part of the Myotis genus. There's Brant's as well, but it looks very similar to Whiskered. So I, I didn't put it on. So there's Dorbenta's, Natteras and Whiskered. Um, they, they all sort of rely on, on woodlands and water bodies um, and then change like the Natteras, for example, um, you know, feeds over damp meadows or insects coming off cow pads, things like that. And then Dorbenton's, as you can see here, it sort of scoops with its tail membrane um, insects emerging from the water. Um, so in terms of what's found in, in Rutland, um, Natteras are found in Rutland with two maternity roosts um, accounted for the National Bat Monitoring Project at Wessingdine and Stoke Dry. So the original count at Wessingdine was 81 bats, um, but floodlights were put around the church in 2008, which um, reduced the, the number of bats emerging in their June count to 39. However, last year, because of COVID, the floodlights weren't switched on, which meant that the count last year went up to 60 bats. So it just shows how sensitive they are to, to lighting. And a small number of naturals have been caught during the enthusiast surveys at Hamilton Peninsula, Barnsdale Wood, Eggleton and Linda Nature Reserves. And these on the whole tend to be males. 
Uh, the whiskered uh, bat, there's a roost in Seaton, although numbers have now declined since uh, there were building alterations. Um, and grounded bats have been found in Oakham, um, including one in the doorway of a shop at Marketplace in 2019. And whiskered have also been caught in uh, during the Nethusias uh, trapping surveys. Uh, brants, there are very few records for brants. Uh, they're very hard to tell apart from whiskered. Um, it's easy with the male, but I won't go into details in case there are kids here. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got sort of three records, uh, definite records for brants. And uh, yeah, and like I said, uh, Rutland Water is ideal um, roosting and, and feeding um, territory for, for Dorbentons. Okay, right, location four is Hannah's Field in Ridlington. So as you can see from the aerial photograph, it's a, it's a village, you know, very green village, lots of trees, looks like mature trees, hedgerows, uh, lawns, and it's sort of surrounded by um, arable fields. So from here, uh, the recording again was, was, was really good. Um, uh, six species were recorded here, including the Barbastel. And um, the most common uh, bat recorded here was common pipistrelle. I mean, this one topped at 753 bats. Um, so that was the 30th of July, 2020. So, you know, there's, there's going, to, going to be a roost. Although, the, of course, as I said before, these aren't going to be individual bats. It will be sometimes, you know, often the same bat going around in circles, but the sheer high volume of, of numbers in one night, it, it sort of um, indicates it can't just be one bat fly, flying around in circles. It's, it's going to be, you know, a good number of bats. So ideally, you know, probably a roost nearby. And so yes, there's a good range here of six different species. And if we have a look here, as you can see, again, feeding activity throughout the night, you know, it all starts at sunset and then it just carries on throughout the night. Um, in this location, I don't know if you can see, but the, there's a different uh, blue, it's like a royal blue, and that's pipistrelle species. And that's because the calls were echolocating at 50 kilohertz. So not at 45 kilohertz, which is a common pipistrelle, or around 55 kilohertz was the soprano pipistrelle. It was a 50 kilohertz, which is the, um, I, I, you can't identify as to which pipistrelle that one is. So I put it as pipistrelle species. But I wonder, because it's that time of year when juveniles are flying, um, whether it could just be um, the juveniles sort of learning how to echolocate and calling, um, which is why their, their call is, is not, um, you know, not, not purely defined as 55 or around 45. But I don't know, that's just me. Um, hypothesizing here. So here's a photograph of the common pipistrelle. So this is the pipistrelle that uh, was recorded the most. It's got, it's similar to the soprano pipistrelle. It weighs same as a two pence piece and sort of fits on your thumb nicely. And it's got this dark face, dark ears, dark forearms. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're very flexible species. Um, they're, they, they, they're happy. Well, they, they use villages, towns, cities, rural areas, countryside, woodlands, um, you know, all sorts of habitats. They, because they're sort of so flexible, that's that sort of helped with their survival really. Um, so yeah, so that's why they've been recorded in high numbers pretty much everywhere because yeah, they're not sensitive to lighting. Um, yeah, so they're the most common ones. Okay, so Halstead, Leicestershire. <laughs> Um, it, three different locations were, were used, so you can see there five, six and seven. So Halstead, for those who don't know, it's uh, near Tilton on the hill. Um, yeah, more towards the west. Okay, so location five was in the back garden. Um, a nice mixture here, three species, brown long ear common pipistrelle and soprano pipistrelle but also picked up Nyctilus species and Myotis species. So again, you know, that's another few species there. And as you can see, probably the first two nights, the weather wasn't too good. Um, very, very quiet in, in number. And on the second night, it was probably after, you know, when it went dark in the evening, it probably rained in the evening and then, and then dried out. And then there's sort of more sort of regular activity throughout the, um, uh, the third night. So again, you know, just smattering compared to the numbers of, of previous sites, it's not as high, but it's still good. You know, and, and when it was dry, the activity was throughout the night. Um, here's a photograph of a brown long-eared bat. Um, they've got sort of these, these long, delicate ears, sort of a medium-sized bat. 
Um, they use perches to sit on to eat uh, large prey, so things like um, yellow underwings and things like that. So if you're somewhere and you see a little pile of droppings, that look like mice droppings and uh, wings, then um, yeah, it's likely you've had your sort of by a, a brown long-eared feeding perch. Um, they catch their insects in two different ways. So either aerial hawking, which is when they catch insects out when they're flying, and gleaning, which is when they pick uh, prey off vegetation. And they eat insects, they catch them either, you know, from ground level up to the tops of trees. Um, and when they eat at ground level, that's, that's when they make them very vulnerable to cat attacks. And the main foods are moths, uh, grasshoppers, but also spiders, harvestmen, earwigs, caterpillars. I mean, as you can tell with their ears, they're, you know, they've got a really good sense of hearing and they'll sort of hover above, you know, round leaves where they can hear insects moving around and sort of hone in on, on them and just pick off the leaves. Um, although they're widespread, they do suffer from barn conversions and re-roofing. Um, there used to be a former maternity roost counted for the National Bat Monitoring Project in Wing since the 1990s, but the number of bats um, counted coming out declined dramatically following building work to the house. And further work was carried out last year when the house changed hands, so we don't know what effect that's going to have on bat numbers as well. Um, uh, brown long ears are present and probably breeding in several Rutland churches, including Greetham, Stretton, Wardley, Clipsham, Brook, and South Lovenham. Lovenham, no, Luffenham, sorry. And, uh, but although they're sort of breeding in some churches, they've also disappeared from some churches where they're also found in the past. For example, Bronson in Rutland, Hambleton, and Ashwell. Okay, so location six, this was facing into a meadow. So here again, three species, but again, um, Nyctilus species and Myotis species, so it could add a few more. And again, just sort of activity um, throughout the night. You know, not huge, huge activity, but still activity nonetheless. Here, uh, location seven facing to the paddock, that had um, a lot more activity, 682 records in total, and it picked up uh, Barbastel here. Uh, only one record, but one record's good. It's fine, it's, I'm happy with that. Um, and we've been, I've been doing more research there with um, Loddington and our own woodland reserves in that area. And we, we think they're using the hedgerows uh, quite a lot in that area. So it's something we're going to explore in further. But so one pass is great. Um, as you can see, sort of activity throughout the night and three, four, five species were recorded here. So that was really good. And um, there's a photo here of a nocturne. This is a, a, a chunky bat. Um, it fits really nicely on your palm. Uh, lovely, lovely, sleek, shiny fur, sometimes a bit gingery and very powerful flyer. Um, they sort of uh, got thin wings that fly high up in the sky and, and sort of really early to come out. Um, yeah, they, they catch sort of bugs, ca uh, caddis, flies, beetles, moths. Um, if there's an emergence of cockchafers or dung beetles, you know, they'll, they'll know year on year where they come out and when and they'll, they'll be there ready. Um, and in the autumn, they hunt shield bugs and hoverflies. Um, they do uh, roost in trees, and a tree roost was found in Burley Wood, and 63 were counted emerging from that roost. So, yeah, that must have been a, you know, a really interesting roost to, you know, because they're big bats, so 63 coming out of that would have been really impressive. Um, and single bats have been seen foraging around Rutland Water. Uh, they're usually seen in September over Field 1 at Linden Nature Reserve, and up to 20 have been seen foraging together on beetles over the cricket pitch at North Luffenham. Um, it's definitely worth going to if you see them um, on a site I used to work at before um, in, in uh, Shropshire. Um, they were eating beetles emerging from the lawn there and I, so I was walking across the lawn kicking up the beetles really sort of encouraging them to fly up and the nocturnes were flying around me catching them and I could hear the nocturnes um, crunching on the beetles. Um, well, I felt sorry for the beetles but it, it was an amazing um, experience to see and to hear so it's definitely worth heading over that way. Speak to Jenny, <laughs> she'll know more details about that. Okay, so in summary, oh, so is that it already? Yeah, I think that's it. So in summary, um, the Rutland bats, um, Rutland provides lots of features for bats. So the huge water bodies at Rutland Water, the lagoons, you know, the sheltered areas, the woodlands, the, the hedgerows, the pasture land, the rivers, the streams, the wet meadows, um, the urban areas for roosting um, opportunities, as well as the woodlands for roosting, 
uh, street lighting. So bats like lysers and noctules um, can sometimes be, um, they'll feed around the insects buzzing around the, um, the street lights and ponds and things like that. So it's no surprise that nine out of the 12 species uh, were just recorded in those four one kilometer tetrads alone. So, you know, that's a, a, a really good record. So, you know, but although, you know, this is really good news, you know, bat, uh, bats are still um, uh, endangered. Uh, although the numbers are, are increasing, they're still at the numbers that they, they were, you know, several decades ago. So still think about what you can do for bats. So dig ponds, uh, if you've got wet meadows, don't drain them, keep them nice and wet. You know, keep your woodlands, uh, think about um, uh, bats roosting in woodlands and, and try and you know, plant some more woodlands if you can. Plant gaps in hedgerows um, using native homegrown species. And basically just try and connect all the, all the really um, good areas together. So link up uh, where they might be roosting to where they might be feeding to where they might you know, go for a drink. So yeah, just sort of connectivity is key really. Um, and it just helps them move, move more easily um, should they need to, um, you know, if, they, if something happens to their roost, if the tree falls and they lose the roost or something happens to the foraging area gets cut for hay like earlier than normal or, you know, to adapt to climate change. Uh, but this is sort of big scale stuff I'm talking about, but it's not just big scale stuff. It's, it's um, oh, things that you can do in your garden. Sorry, I copied, copied and pasted, I didn't realize it came with, uh, movement but anyway so in your garden plant trees shrubs and climbers um create wet area it doesn't you know ponds don't have to be huge it could just be a bin lid just anything um anything goes um yeah don't put fish in it because fish eat everything that goes into the pond um so yeah don't have fish in it um compost heaps and log piles are really good for, for just for insects to you know to beetles to to bore into uh, avoid using pesticides and sort of encourage natural predators um, and also, you know, if you have security lights on, that's understandable, but try and choose ones with sensors so they don't come on, you know, they're not on all night, you know, they only come on if there's some, you know, something moving around outside. And if you've got cats, please bring cats indoors between dusk and dawn. They're sort of the major um, um, sort of predator, well, they are the major predator of bats and I think it's estimated, I just saw a report earlier, I think they injure like 250,000 bats, <laughs> I think a year, which is frightening if that's if, if I remembered it rightly but anyway just bring them in it will help um, birds as well nesting birds at this time of year Ooh, there's a bird. right so quickly I'm going to go through other bat activities taking place in Rutland so here in 2018 um, I organized a bat survey weekend at Hambleton Wood in, in, yeah, in 2018 um, work was going to be some management work was going to be carried out here and um, thought it'd be really interesting to learn about how um, how you know, learn about how to identify uh, roost features in trees. Um, so yeah, got, we had people from six different bat groups coming, some really experienced people, and it, it was a real um, great learning weekend. Um, and uh, yeah, so we were looking at, uh, you can see there's somebody up here in the tree, Sam up here in the tree. Um, so we were looking from big trees and then we were chatting about where bats might be. And then Thibaut here, he points up and I don't know if you can see there's like cankers here, these dark marks, actually it's this one. This limb had um, snapped and fallen down and the canker was upside down and there was a common pipistrelle roosting. And that's the, that's the only bat we found and we'd, we'd surveyed hundreds of trees. And it was just ironic that it was just in this tiny little canker. Um, so yeah, so don't be fooled, don't think that the, the bats only use, you know, massive large trees with, you know, woodpecker holes and things like that. They'll use, you know, these skinny little spindly things as well. So yes, yeah, so that was a really good weekend. Um, we also do National Nethusiast Pipistrelle Survey of Rutland Water that was started, I believe, in 2013 by Matt Cook, carried on by Tom Bennett, who I believe is in the audience. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details because he's going to do a fantastic talk at the Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust Recorders Conference next week. So please book onto that and he'll tell you more about all the, all the work we've been doing. But here's a few photographs. So really what it involves is, again, you know, quite a few people from different back groups all getting together. We put up these harp traps here, which are these square framed um, sort of nylon wire all along here, it's like fishing wire. And basically the bat flies into it, sort of hits the wire, slides down and then, and then just goes and waits in this, uh, this bag that we, we go and check regularly and retrieve them. Um, so here in the corner we've got a whiskered, a door Bentons, and here's an enthusiast pipistrelle with a with a ring put on. 
So this is part of a monitoring project where rings are put on the Nathusius pipistrels, a bit like bird ringing. So if they're caught elsewhere, we can get a really good idea of, of how far they're migrating and, and sort of their movement really, find out a bit more about this new species. If you want to find more about it, please book on the uh, LRWT Recorders Conference. Right. Uh, we've also been involved with Bats in Churches. It's a lottery funded project run by uh, Bat Conservation Trust. And we've been doing work with them um, at Bronson and Rutland. Um, the, they had a lot of problems with uh, bats coming into the church and droppings and urine sort of staining the, the, the bronze and the, or the marble in there. And it was causing a problem for the congregation. So bats in churches came and helped out with consultants and they put in mitigation work. So work to stop the bats from going into the church, but still allows the bats to use the church. So um, a couple of years ago, um, myself and Anne, uh, we did uh, a talk for uh, people who are interested. We sort of had a buffet lunch at the local pub, um, Blue Ball, I think. And um, yes, yeah, so and then we did a talk for anyone who was interested. And then we all sort of sat outside with bat detectors, as you can see, as the sun went down and, uh, and just listened and watched the bats come out. And, and people were amazed, were, were fascinated by that. So hopefully it's something we can carry on. Um, this is Phil here, um, he's one of the Northwest Group volunteers and he brilliantly made me 100 bat boxes, this Kent style bat boxes, to put in the woodlands, um, Prize Coppice which is in Rutland, but also the woods at Lawnd which is just inside Leicestershire and um, with a hope just to, to monitor the bats. So there's a red arrow here pointing to a bat um, these boxes are really easy, you know, handy to check. You can just check from underneath with binoculars and a, and a bright torch. But again, you have to have a bat license to do this because it does disturb them. Um, so it's a great way of monitoring uh, what bats use in the wood. And it's something I want to do more of. Um, and uh, this is Jenny on the left and Jules on the right. Um, so yes, these aren't sort of bat protection suits. They're beekeeper suits. Um, and what it was is there's a soprano uh, pipistrelle roost at uh, Whitwell Sports Centre at Rutland Water, a roost of up to 280 soprano pipistrelles, but a wasp decided to build its nest um, where the roost was. So as it says on the text, although a few bats were using the roost, they didn't emerge until really late, until the wasps had, had sort of gone to bed, I don't know what they do, <laughs> gone to sleep. Um, and so under uh, Natural England advice uh, with, and Jenny and Jules there, there was a professional bat friendly pest control officer that killed and removed the wasp nest, which allowed then the, the bats to, um, uh, to carry on uh, using the roost uh, how they should be. Okay, so I've come to the end. I've no idea how long I've lasted, sorry about that. So yes, a little cartoon. So unfortunately, sort of, you know, as everyone knows, COVID, uh, it stopped all activity last year. I mean, we managed to squeeze a few um, safe bat walks in, um, but yeah, it's really stopped all our work. So we're all chomping at the bit, but we'll only return um, this year, you know, when it's safe to do so. Um, not because we're worried about getting COVID from the bats, but because we're more worried about giving COVID to the bats. Um, who knows if that can happen, but we don't know. So it's best to be on the safe side. So there's lots of activities we want to do. We want to resume bat walks you know, survey work, um, you know, the, the Nathusia trapping, all sorts of activities, you know, we're chomping at the bit, ready to get going. So if you keep an eye out on our website, which is just written here, and on our Facebook page group, you know, hopefully as soon as we go activities, we'll be putting them up. So that's me. Um, hopefully that was okay. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, we've we've got a few questions uh, listed now. I'm joined here with um, Becky, who's going to actually um, do the do the queue, the questions bit, and hopefully Natalie will be able to uh, to answer those. So over to you, Becky. I'm sure you will. Um, there was one comment that, um, and I think it must be from somebody that lives in Ketton at the Chater site that there were so so few myotis at the Chater site considering that Dorbentons are very prevalent on the river. Can yeah think? it might have just been where the bat detector was placed um, you know sometimes it's placed where it's easier for access so it might have just been in a more open area but yeah it I don't know I mean maybe if it had been pointing more in the woodland uh, you know along the river um, it might have picked up more myotis um, yeah I'm not I'm not sure about that but I find it, it always surprises me as well. I put the bat detector up somewhere. I think, oh, yeah, it's definitely going to get this. And it doesn't get them at all. And, um, 
yeah, I, I never quite know why. Um, they don't read the books, obviously. Okay, thank you. And um, do you, there was a question also about how bats might change as climate warms. Um, yeah, they have been doing some, uh, as part of the National Bat Monitoring Survey, that we have been sort of monitoring sort of emergence and and with bat detectors getting better, um, you know, it's making it a lot easier to identify bats to species level. And um, we've been sort of finding that uh, bats, for example, lesser horseshoe bats have been sort of moving from the sort of southwest and Wales sort of further across our area. Um, so we're definitely, you know, we're at the northern range of a, of a few species. Uh, but now I think with climate change, uh, we're, you know, will benefit bat wise in terms of that because I think we'll definitely get more species, you know, coming up into into Rutland. So yeah, that would be positive in terms of, of the bat as aspect anyway. Um, and somebody asked if you could remind them what the type of bat detector we used. Yeah, it was a song meter four for bats. Um, yeah, there's lots of different bat detectors out there. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, full spectrum. If you really want to buy one, yeah, I recommend the SM4 full spectrum bat detector. They do a smaller version now for £730, which I know because I'm hoping to buy 10 of them. So for another project we're doing with the Wildlife Trust, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, they're really good bat detectors, but you can get handheld ones from sort of about £60 onwards. It just all depends on on what you how you want to use it. Donations are welcome. <laughs> Um, somebody else asked what what is a tetrad please oh sorry yeah i'm not sure what a tetrad is either this is what it said on the record center bit it's um it's uh, just a, a grid reference it's a square on a, 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 a ordinate survey map so you get them different sizes so this was like a one meter by one meter square but you can get them 10 by 10 kilometer squares and things like that but this was a so it's a square on a uh, area on a map one kilometer by one kilometer thank you uh i think you might have on answered this question in the talk actually but somebody asked the question what are the what's the main predator of the bats yeah cats yeah so yeah definitely yeah it's cats um yeah there'll be also um you know owls uh very you know the corvid crow magpie family you know at dusk and dawn but it, yeah it's, it's unfortunate it's cats yeah and um do they carry any diseases that cross species the bats that is not the cats um not in the uk that i'm aware of um i mean yeah we, we're all aware of of what's been going on this past year um yeah but in the uk uh, no nothing that cross species i mean there is a, a lissera type 2 rabies that some of the bat species have but but again we've been um uh, doing testing, monitoring for, for like 20 years, um, bats that are found uh, dead, uh, they're sent and, and tested. And I think only like nine out of like 20,000 bats, uh, only nine have, have come up with this type of rabies. So, so yes, yeah, so it, yeah, apart from that, then not, not the time aware. Um, somebody has asked, um, you mentioned that several buildings, uh, well, building works have led to reduction in roost numbers does does do you think that means that legal protection that bats have doesn't work always um i'm not a very tactful person <laughs> no it doesn't work basically no the protections are there but they're easily they're easily ignored and um and often there's no there's no um will or money or checks done afterwards so you know, they, they might be allowed to destroy a roost, but mitigate by, I don't know, putting up some bat boxes and, you know, planting some trees or something. But then it, it, appear, it doesn't seem like anybody actually checks that these have worked. Um, I think for big schemes, I think, I, I'm not a consultant, so I don't really know how this works, but um, sometimes, for example, if there's a really uh, well-established maternity roost in a building, the mitigation, so for example, a, a suitable site for them to roost in um, has to be built while their roost is existing. And then once they've moved over and are shown to be using the new one, then they can remove the old one. But I don't know, it's, it feels as well that often um, buildings get destroyed or set fire to before the planning permission goes in. So then, you know, there's nothing, bats aren't there anymore, obviously. Um, so that sort of 
solves the problem for for developers some developers thank you um sorry i hope i've answered question. the question sorry. yes you have <laughs> there's a question from diana she, she has a back box which she'd like to put on on her house is there an optimum height to install a box and the house backs onto woodland but that side of the house doesn't get much sun does that matter um I think they're sort of usually about sort of three, four meters high. It's however safe you feel putting them up, really. The key thing is, is it's not to have sort of dense vegetation directly underneath. No security light flashing on the light or like an alarm sensor that might uh, emit a high frequency pitch and can't get reached by cats. Um, yeah, um, in terms of facing it, probably sort of west, south, east facing I wouldn't put it north facing um, because that would get really cold and um, they might freeze in the box but yeah just put it up and, and just see really um, thank you and there's a question uh, that is asking do bats hibernate yes they do um, although sort of in the, more in the southwest where it's milder um, you yeah, know bats bats do come out um, um, still even in the winter um, they do move around as well. Like sometimes when we do hibernation checks, there'll be, you know, for example, you know, th three door Bentons and a brown long eared, and then we'll come a month later to do the, the check again. And um, there'll only be one bat, or they'll have moved around in the crevices, or it'll have changed the species. So, you know, although they do hibernate, they do seem to, to move around. Um, I think when it gets a bit milder, they might come out to drink. Um, some males, depending on the species, um, might take advantage and do a bit of hanky panky. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so they do move around. Um, some species more than others, like barbastels, do come out when it's cold. Um, they seem to be a bit more cold tolerant than other species. So, yeah, it really varies. Although it gets quite confusing because if they come out when, it, when we have sort of milder times, sort of say February, for example, they might start coming out and, and sort of burning a lot of calories waking up. Um, and then it gets really cold again. And so they've got to go back into to hibernation or sort of torpor. Um, and so if that happens too often, then they, they can sort of really sort of run out of calories because it, it's, um, yeah, it takes a lot of calories to sort of warm up and, and, and start flying again for them. So yeah, this sort of cold and mild, cold and mild, it's, it's not ideal for them, but yeah, that's how it is. That's good lead into the next question actually, because the next question is, do they eat hibernating butterflies actually specifically but other insects as well um yeah i don't know because i the few tunnels i've seen there have always been some hibernating peacocks and spiders um and bats but then i don't yeah i, I to be honest i'm not sure yeah i don't know i could i could wonder whether they take opportunity but i wonder if the bat if the the butterfly has got cold and is not moving when if they if the bats start flying they might not notice that it's an insect to eat that's true actually yeah. i'm not sure okay um, Sorry. and just and on sort of the same type of subject really is are there any winter surveys that consider sort of how much warmer in general our winters are getting and the impact that might have yes there's bound to be um I just saw earlier that if you go on to uh, bats.org.uk, that's the Bat Conservation Trust website. And as part of the National Bat Monitoring um, Survey, they've been doing all sorts of um, um, studies uh, throughout the, either spring, you know, spring, summer and, and winter surveys. And they also sort of help fund research projects. So um, there's been quite a few papers that have come out. So it'd be worth looking on that on, on their website and, and seeing. Um, and seeing because it, people are bound to be studying the effects of uh, climate change and the changing temperatures on bat species. Um, so yes, uh, I can't answer that now, but I'm sure it's been done and it's something I need to add to my reading list. Okay, we've got a, a question here. We had bats flying frequently at the back of our houses in the allotments. Um, and unfortunately, um, a local club cut down a lot of the trees and now we don't see as many bats out there, if any. Is there a local group to Coventry that you know of that, that um, this person could get hold of one of the meters to leave in the area to see if there's any actual decline or not? Um, yeah, it's best they speak to the Warwickshire Bat Group 
Um, they're a really active back group. They've got really good experts on their committee. Um, so yeah, if you if they look up a Wiltshire back group and get in touch with them, um, they seem a really friendly group and, and are keen to help. So so yeah, that would be my advice. Yeah. And uh, we've just got a few more questions, if that's okay. Are the low levels of recording of the long-eared bats what you would expect? Um, yes, because um, because they've got big ears, they're very quiet, um, echolocating. They, d they don't sort of um, shout as loud as the others because they don't need to because they can hear really well. And um, so the bats, the brown long ears, will have to be actually really close to the, to the microphone um, for it to, to pick them up. I mean, they're quite nosy uh, bats. I did put the bat detector up in a location um, uh, on one of the trust nature reserve at Narborough Bog. And um, I've got lots of uh, really interesting brown long-eared calls. So it just seems like this brown long-eared was just sort of going around the, the microphone, sort of thinking, what's this? This is new in my patch. Um, so yeah, it's what I expect. They're, they're very quiet um, and really hard to, to pick up on the bat detectors. Um, yeah. Okay, and another question is, is now a good time of year to start looking for them or listening for them, I suppose? Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any yet, but um, I've been seeing on the various Facebook back groups that, um, yeah, people are starting to see them, you know, so especially on a mild evening, mild dry evening, um, you know, I've, when I've gone on the reserves, the midges are out. So, so yes, it would be worth having a look and if you've got back detectors sticking it out. And um, as well, some people have, there's a group as well that sort of recorded throughout the whole winter. So, and they're picking up, I mean, low numbers, but they're still picking up bats. So, so yeah, if you're out, why not? Let's get some fresh air. Brilliant. And I think we have got one last question, which is an interesting one. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> it was, well, the question is, where do some of the names for bat species come from? So, for instance, Dorbentons, Lyslers and Barbastels, are they named after people? Yes, yeah, some of them are because um, some of the bats, uh, some of the names you you start with a capital letter and some you don't. So uh, yes, yeah, some of the names. So the Dorbentons, it's Myotis, uh, Dorben, Dorbentoni. So yeah, it's after somebody's name. So it's the same with Lyslers, um, Nathusias. Yeah, but not Whiskered, but Branzes. So yeah, Branz you have to put with a capital B, Whiskered, it's a little W and things like that. So yeah, it'll be the names of, of uh, either whoever found them or identified them or yeah, something like that. Okay, we've just had one more pop up if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, go, I'll bring my books out just so you know, just in case, <laughs> try and cover them all quick. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's do bats have a breeding season? Um, yes, they do. They, um, they breed in the... Um, I keep thinking Jenny's asking all these questions just to t check me but anyway uh, yeah they um, they breed mainly in the autumn so species like uh, the, the Dorbentons, the Naturas, uh, brown long ears um, they they form sort of these autumn swarms um, good one to see is a whole wild nature reserve near Melton and so they'll sort of get together in the autumn and they sort of socialize and that's sort of when they believe they mate um, so they tend to mate in the autumn, although some will mate um, in the winter if it's mild. Um, and some sort of really, you know, as soon as they come out of hibernation, but it seems to be mainly in the autumn. And like badgers, um, the females will delay fertilization of, of the egg until they come out of hibernation. So although they mate in the autumn, they'll delay fertilization, they'll come out of hibernation. And then when they feel that there's sort of enough uh, food around and the temperatures are going, uh, you know, are getting warmer, They'll, you know, they'll allow um, fertilization to happen and they'll, they'll get pregnant, um, which I think is like three or four weeks, I think, the pregnancy. And then I don't think it's all oh, six weeks. Anyway, it's not very long. It's only a few weeks in comparison to people. So, yeah. OK, that's the last question. There's only one more, but I think I can answer that. And it's can the recording be viewed at a later date? And the answer is yes. I think um, you should be able to get it from the LRWT website so okay. on YouTube. So thank you. I'm going to hand That's over right. to Anthony now and switch myself off. Show some books in case anyone's interested in learning more. Lots of uh, interesting books out there. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. That was um, that was really good. And I think certainly from um, some of the uh, comments that have come up on the chat, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of interest. A fascinating um, talk indeed. Um, 
very interesting, of course, because um, some of the, of course, your data has come from um, sites around Rutland and they certainly illustrate very clearly that um, habitat makes a huge difference to the activity of bats in the area. Natalie, thank you very much. And I know as a bat person, um, you are also, of course, a conservation officer. And, and I know from my limited, very small um, experience of, um, of doing some bat watching, a lot of your work has to be done in your own time. So we thank you all for that um, and wish you, um, wish you very well uh, for your um, bat work around, um, around the two counties in the future. Thanks very much indeed. Great. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Um, brilliant talk. Um, we'll now um, sort of wait a few moments and then we'll be moving on to the Rutland uh, group AGM. So if you'd like to stay on for the AGM, then, then hang around. We'll, we'll wait for a few minutes. And if you don't, then thank you very much for joining us. And um, we'll see you again soon. We've got lots more talk coming up over the next few months so please head to our website to book on to um our next talk and um the recorders conference that natalie mentioned is on the 25th of march that's 10 till 1 on the 25th of march and there's going to be lots of interesting talks from different um recording specialists in leicestershire and rutland so that would be um should be a good morning um yeah thank you very much Um, we'll just give it a moment, shall we? Um, if there are some Rutland members now, if you're happy to hang on so that we can get through our... Um, no, I think the thing's gone again. Hello? Sorry, my uh, the internet's in unstable in Stamford. Oh. Right, um, if there's a few Rutland members still left, please, we're going to carry on with our, our AGM. I'm just going to share my screen and put the agenda up.